So here's your equation for a Gaussian probability curve. Uh, you call it a bell curve, a normal curve. It's the curve, okay, my drawing is bad, but mu is supposed to be the expected value or the center or the average of the curve. And it's a bell-shaped curve, a hump-shaped curve like that. If I could draw, it would be symmetrical, right? We know that. The, the standard Gaussian curve, the standard normal curve, has a variance of 1, a sigma of 1, a standard deviation of 1. Variance is just sigma squared. If I change the variance, okay, now let's, let's change the mu first, the average. If I change the mu, it just takes the curve and shifts it one way or another. The center of the hump is always above mu. So that doesn't change the shape of the curve. It just shifts it left or right. Now, if I have different variances, so here's mu. If I make a variance that's really small, let's say 0.001, then that variance is the spread of the data. So I get a really skinny bell curve. If I make, if I make the standard deviation, variance is sigma squared, let's make it a big number like 100. That it's still centered about mu, but now it's the data is really spread out. The standard deviation is big, so it's it's really spread out. Now in each one of these, under each one of these curves, the area is always one. We'll look at that in a different video, but it's a probability distribution, so the area underneath it from minus infinity to plus infinity is always 1. So if I spread it out, because the area is always 1, it has to flatten down above its hump at mu. If I turn the variance, if I turn the sigma right down to, let's say, 0.01, that means the spread of the data is really small, but the area underneath the curve has to be 1, so that's why you're squishing it super tall. It becomes this, you know, taller, skinnier Gaussian curve. So here's our equation then. Sigma has to do with the spread of the data. That's always positive. Mu, that's our center of the hump. And x, well, x is the variable that we're getting the probability for. All right. So sigma and mu are parameters. X is the variable. Let's go back to our equation here, and I guess what I'm interested in is what happens when I take sigma and it keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. All right, well, from my pictures, I said that the curve area is 1, so the curve gets skinnier and skinnier, and because the area is 1, as it gets skinnier and skinnier, it has to get you know pushed up higher and higher and higher. But what happens in the limit? What happens when I take the limit? So I've got my probability function here, and I'm going to take the limit as sigma goes to zero. Squishing my curve in having it shoot up above mu. Uh, now the sigma approaches zero from the positive side because you can't have a negative standard deviation. So that's why I've got a little superscript positive there. Now let's just take that limit. The well, the zero on the bottom here means that the denominator of this fraction goes to zero. Let's take a look at here. I've got e to the minus exponent. This exponent, because the sigma's on the bottom and the denominator goes to zero, so that highlighted exponent goes to infinity. e to the minus infinity is zero. So if, when I take the limit as sigma goes to zero, I've got uh, zero over zero, indeterminate form. So I know that what people would normally do would be like, oh, well, L'Hopital's rule. Let's do L'Hopital's rule on it. Take the derivative of the top, the derivative of the bottom separately, not quotient rule. Uh, let's do L'Hopital's. Before I do L'Hopital's, let's make note of the exponent, the thing that's above the e in the exponent. I'm only differentiating with respect to sigma, so I'm going to think of this expression as, well, x minus mu squared, that's a constant, 2 is a constant, 
I'm going to bring think of that sigma squared on the bottom as this constant term times sigma to the minus 2. So when I take the derivative, the minus 2 comes down and I subtract 1 from the exponent, so it becomes minus 3. So when I differentiate the top, so we can put that up there as the top to try and see a 0 over 0. When I differentiate the top, the derivative of e to the something is e to that something times the derivative of what's up top. So I'm taking the derivative of this argument in the exponential. This piece is a constant, so like I said, the minus 2 comes down. When the minus 2 comes down, it's going to cancel out that minus and the 2 on the bottom. Subtract 1 from the exponent, that'll make this, so when I differentiate, that'll make that a minus 3. And now I put the sigma to the minus 3 on the bottom. So this is me, I differentiated the top, differentiated the bottom. Technically, I still need that limit because I haven't taken the limit yet. I could use L'Hopital's because it was infinity over infinity. Now when I take the limit as sigma goes to zero, um, that's just a constant. So same argument, that's going to go to zero. This also goes to zero. I've still got zero over zero. Um, I've still got zero over zero. If I try to do it again, so L'Hopital's again, and I guess I can, I'm allowed to because it's 0 over 0, that's going to make it sigma to the fourth on the bottom. So it was sigma, then it was sigma squared, now it's like sigma to the fourth on the bottom. Uh, it's just getting worse. So L'Hopital's as it stands is not doing the job, so I'm, I'm abandoning this idea right now. So how am I going to take the limit? I still need to know what happens to this Gaussian curve as sigma goes to zero. Well, I'm going to set it equal to L for the limit. I'm trying to find out what L is. And I'm going to use logarithmic. Uh, I'm going to take the log of both sides. I'm going to take the natural lawn of both sides. When I take, now the lawn's a continuous function, so the lawn, the lawn of the limit is the limit of the lawn. So I'm taking the lawn of both sides. When I take the lawn of a fraction, it's going to be lawn of the top minus lawn of the bottom. Now, lawn of the top, lawn of e, they're inverse functions, they cancel each other out. So, lawn of the top minus lawn of the bottom. And ln of the bottom is the product of that, and the ln of a product is ln of sigma plus, where is my sigma? Sigma plus the ln of square root of pi. So I've taken the natural logarithm of that expression, used my ln rules to break it up into those three pieces, and that would be equal to the ln of L. So now I'm going to end up, I don't need these pieces. Now I'm going to end up taking, taking the limit as n approaches infinity here, of n approaches infinity, of, I'm taking the limit as sigma approaches zero of this side. And if I can get a number for that, that's equal to the ln of L, and then I can just figure out what L has to be. Now let's just say straight, take our, take our limit as um, sigma goes to zero. Oh, and you know what? I'm, well, that's going to be a number uh, over zero. This piece goes to infinity with the negative. So this piece goes to negative infinity. In the limit, the ln of zero is also negative infinity. So this is negative infinity minus uh, minus infinity. This ends up being negative infinity plus positive infinity plus, that's a constant, uh, that's another indeterminate form, right? Minus infinity plus infinity, I don't know what that is. So I'm going to common denominator this piece again. This piece I'm not worried about at all because that's just a constant. So 
let's let's put this as one fraction. So I common denominated those two fractions together so that now as sigma goes to zero, it's this piece here is zero on the bottom and it's also, oh, it's um, zero times infinity here. That's another indeterminate form. Ah, let's, let's work on that separately. So this is my, this is my concern here. And I'm going to write this as uh, sigma squared on the top. I'm just thinking about this limit here because I don't know what I don't. It's an indeterminate form. I don't know what it is. So now, as sigma goes to zero, I get a zero on. Uh, I should. That's going to. I should switch that around. Because now I get to the negative 2. So, I'm, again, I'm, I'm looking at this piece here. I'm getting negative infinity over positive infinity. So this is an infinity over infinity. It's another, it's another one that I can use L'Hopital's rule with. So I'm going to take derivative of the top. Oh, I don't know this equals sign. Derivative of the top is just going to be 1 over sigma. One over sigma. And derivative of the bottom, the minus two is going to come down, subtract one from the exponent. Now this looks like I'm in the same you know boat as I was up here, except that I can I can simplify this a little bit before I take the limit as sigma goes to zero. So let's multiply top and bottom of this by uh, sigma cubed. And when I do that, the sigma here cancels one of the sigmas here. Anyway, long story over short, I I end up getting not L'Hopital's, it's just 0 over negative 2. So this whole piece goes to 0 when I take the limit. Okay, what does this whole line tell me? That means when I take the limit as sigma goes to 0, this piece goes to 0. So the, the, the numerator here is a constant minus 0. The numerator here is a constant. The denominator goes to 0. So uh, a number divided by zero in the limit ends up being negative, ends up being infinity with this negative. So this is negative infinity plus a constant. So the ln of the limit is equal to, in the limit, negative infinity, which means that the L, the ln of what is negative infinity, the limit itself must be zero. Okay, what does all this show? All this shows is that as sig, I'm going to go up to my Gaussian curve here. When sigma is equal to zero, then the probability is equal to zero. Okay, the, the, this, is, this is banging up against my area under the curve is equal to 1 idea. But, oh, there's one thing I didn't consider. Now, everything I did, every, all the math I did, L'Hopital's derivatives and all that, it, it worked for all x's and mu's. We never used x's and mu's. I'm taking the limit as sigma goes to 0 for whatever x and mu there are. Except there's one scenario here where what I did isn't good. I started this whole process by getting L'Hopital 0 over 0. 
but if if x was equal to mu then this would be a zero and e to the zero would be one and so when x is equal to mu this isn't zero over zero in the limit it's one over zero so if x is equal to mu then in the limit that probability is equal to infinity okay so here's the payoff then or what here's what i'm trying to say when i take the limit as sigma goes to zero and to be technically correct the best kind of correct I'm going to put a plus sign there. Of this probability distribution, it's equal to, well, it's equal to two things, depending on whether sigma is equal to, or sorry, depending on whether x is equal to mu or not. It's equal to zero if x doesn't equal where's my doesn't equal doesn't equal mu and it's equal to infinity if it does so there's our limit oh that's the Dirac delta function, right? It's zero everywhere except for an infinite spike. And I guess it's the Dirac delta function shifted with its spike centered at the number mu. So the Gaussian probability curve with zero var variance is the Dirac delta function. That's what the point of all this is. Oh, now we know the area under the Gaussian curve is one. That means the area under that infinite spike should be one. Uh, yeah, we can prove that. We can prove that in a different way, thinking of the Dirac delta function as the derivative of the Heaviside step function, and then doing some integration by parts. We'll see that in other places. So right now I've got that this limit, if I go back to my, uh, as sigma gets closer and closer to zero, when sigma is equal to zero, it's just this infinite spike at mu. Zero everywhere here, everywhere here, infinity. And the area underneath that infinite spike is one.